Good evening. Um, I have a confession to make. I'm actually from a very small little country called Bavaria, which is between Germany and Austria. But I left it about 13 and a half years ago. So I am more fluent in these business terms and technology terms when I'm talking in English. And my mother always says that right now, when I'm, when I'm talking in German, I have the grammar and vocabulary level of a seven-year-old. So unless you want to talk about FC Bayern Munich, um, I think you're better off with me talking in, in English. Um, I was earlier here today talking to the organizers in, in German, and we, um, I, I did offer to them, look, guys, I, I can try this in, in German. That should be doable. And uh, I don't know if I should be insulted, but they said no. <laughs> Please do it in English. Which, actually, the irony of the whole thing is, I had Deutsch LK when I was in Germany. So, so much about the, the building and, and, and education. What I would do now in the next half hour is tell you about the crowd and the power of the crowd and how that changes what, what we all do. If you are a CEO, chairman, president, or chancellor, I have bad news for you. You're not in charge anymore. The crowd is. They are already connected. They want to be involved. And they are getting organized. So for you, that means as an organization, as a foundation, as a government, that means you have to open up. You have to use it. Or you will lose it, or they will abuse you. Let me tell you a story before we go into the, the slide deck. And I'll make it as quick and entertaining as, as I can. And I think what we'll do is we'll probably leave the questions to the end. And then if you want to ask them in German, I'll definitely try and stumble my way through and, and, and answer them. And, but I'm also around for, for drinks. So let me tell you a story, because I think it's very powerful and, and shows you what, what I mean with an example. I was giving this, this kind of crowded speech a half a year ago in Paris. And afterwards, I had dinner with the CEO of a very big pharmaceutical company. And he, he sat down and he said, after, after listening to this, he said, Simon, I'm scared. I just realized that I need to completely change everything we do in our entire company in order to survive. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he explained that he just invested over a couple of years, many hundreds of millions of dollars, into a new drug for diabetes. They went through all the stages and got it to, to a prototype and just didn't get the approval of the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in America. And the problem was that he couldn't identify the 2% of the population, the patient population, who would be allergic to this new drug. He, he couldn't get that data from the patients. And he said, I would kill for it. I would give so much money to get that. But they don't play with me. They don't give me that data. And then li listening to, to my speech, he, he said, I, I just realized something. There are 346 million people who have diabetes. 346 million people. They would absolutely give their data if that makes their life better, if someone finds a drug for diabetes. They wouldn't mind, you know, Test, they're testing themselves for, for insulin level anyways every, every day, a couple of day, times a day. They wouldn't mind telling someone up there what the, you know, how they're reacting to it. They wouldn't actually even mind giving some money, a dollar per person, for a cure of diabetes. It's 346 million. That's quite some money. You can crowdfund it. So he, he realized, he said, shit, I either work with these people or they do it without me, and I, I'm obsolete. Not my words, but I think that shows you right away in this example the power of the crowd and how CEOs right now are changing the way they think. I'm, I'm not a Mac person, as you can tell. I'll, I'll make this quick, and what we want to do is I want to talk to you about what I mean about what is this, this crowd and, and you know, why are they in charge. What is this crowdsourcing, open innovation thing that I keep you know, talking about everywhere I go? And finally, without leaving you hanging, I'm also going to tell you, all right, well, how can you use that in a simple way? And how do you make sure it's a success for you as an organization? And then finally, I was asked by the organizers to, to also talk a little about the, the hurdles I see. But let's see if we get to that. That might be something you know, to, to, to cancel off for today. All right, 
the, the crowd is in charge, and this is my personal development evolution of the internet. Um, so I bet there's a lot of criticism and debate about this chart, which, believe me, this is not the point. I, I actually had a, um, lunch with a guy from ARPANET um, over, over the weekend. So he worked in 1982 in ARPANET, and he was working on the SMT headers, which, by the way, not the most fascinating discussion ever, but he actually corrected me too, so in, you know, fine, ARPANET invented this in 1982, so, you know, let's not talk about the details. The point here is that if you're looking back to the beginnings, the internet and web pages were static. They were, they didn't change in any way how, a, how any organization changed their business. It was a communication tool, and a one-way tool at that, like print. So let's move on. We got to this web 2.0, which is dead, thank God, and the idea here was oh, let's involve the user. They can create content. Wouldn't that be smart? And let's have a two-way communication stream. Great, that's what they did. But actually, they didn't change anything in terms of how they do their business. They just kept the typical way of doing. And that's what I mean now with this, I call it the crowd web, call it whatever you want. I'm not trying to coin a term here. The change here is now that the crowd is not longer happy just being a bystander. They want to be in charge. They want to be listened to in making decisions, not just waiting for the CEO making the, the decision of what the product should look like and us customers having to deal with this. That's over. And that's what this new crowd web is, and that just shows you my personal way of you know, putting this into the time. Social networks have been growing. They now have the power of countries and religions. They have created and new companies that are now in the billions of dollars worth, a few, just a few years old. They also have the power to destroy. They can change governments if, you don't, if you're not open and transparent. They can eat companies. They can destroy companies that are not opening up to the way they want to do it. And also, they can abuse you. If you don't play by the rules, whatever the rules are, I'm not saying that the right rules, they can attack you. So what, what is this crowdsourcing thing? Well, this is a very clever slide I put up, which is done by a professor, as you can tell, because it's so busy. But it's still a good slide, because it kind of summarizes a bit of what, what is open innovation and what is closed innovation. And my simplest example, explanation is, closed is the same slide without the little dots. So you have a funnel. And the old funnel looked like this. I'm the CEO of a company, and we're sitting around my boardroom, and I just say, all right, guys, you need to get into China. That's, that's really what we need to get to. So, Charlie, you're head of R&D. I want you to think about the new way, how we do a new product, you know, and then you take it over to Tom. Tom is going to do the marketing for China. And then finally, over there, Sally, you run the selling and you bring it to you know, the customer in, in China. It's a very in-house way of doing it, a very top-down approach of how innovation has been done before. The new way of doing it is open. So what, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that instead of a top-down approach where I decide everything, I might actually think, well, I got a lot of people here who are my, my, my employees. They might not work in R&D, but they might have great ideas that he doesn't think of because he's 65 years old and has done this for 25 years, and he doesn't actually use an iPad, so why are we selling iPads to Chinese that are designed by him? Well, since we're there, using our internal crowd, if you will, why not ask our suppliers? They know what we are good at. They know our weaknesses. Might as well ask their opinion about it. And why stop there? Let's ask our customers. They care. They have opinions. They actually will buy the stuff if they listen to and if we're changing it to their, their preferences. And finally, let's ask the world. Everybody's opinion counts. That is what open innovation is. In another slide, another way of looking at it is this. Closed innovation is what you would see here in, in yellow. It's the old belief that I just hire the smartest people. All you guys here are my employees. You're the smartest people. I hired you from Harvard, MIT, and so on. Let's do this together, because you are the smartest people in the world. Well, that's clearly not true. I mean, in, of course, in this case. And the idea that there are smarter people out there that you don't employ is the basis of open innovation. And so, for example, what does this mean? Typically, 
I have to kind of stand sideways so I can point better. Again, you, you might have your staff that worked on your innovation products and you know, technologies. You might even have already thought of going into the orange bit of experts you don't employ. You know, again, consultants, McKinsey, Harvard, MIT, Cambridge, Oxford, and TU München, here we go. And that's already given. But then what about all the blue stuff? These are people that no one has ever thought of. Retired in the field expert. Experts that have expertise, just not in chemistry where you are. Or just gifted amateurs. Sounds great, Simon. Where's the proof? Here's the proof. Because that sounds great in theory. So what we've done in, in, in Ocentive, we have a data set of 1,450-something open innovation competitions that we have run before with 260,000 people who are you know, working on these problems every day. So we, we asked Harvard Business School to look through our data set and examine and analyze who the people are that solve the problems. What they found out was that if you had a problem, the actual chance of someone outside that field solving my particular problem is 10% higher than an insider solving it. That is amazing. And it shows, again, that this blue area is the open innovation about the part that you need to open up to. Or again, if you're a citizen, that's where you need to, that's where your skills are, that's where you can help. So th since we're talking about digital, um, this is probably a good um, way of comparing it. Uh, it's, you know, my comparison, so there are probably a lot of flaws in there. But I think that crowdsourcing is something like the cloud computing for humans. And, and you're all familiar with cloud computing. But again, the logic is pretty much the similar, the same, is I have a problem, and I know, and I need this IBM server, which is going to cost me about $20,000, and I will, it will need to compute on my problem for about two months, because it's a huge genome sequencing problem I have. So two months and $20,000. And I'll have this IBM server forever. Or I go to Amazon and I rent a cloud. They're going to work on my problem for about 20 minutes. It's about 1,000 computers, whatever I want. And last time I checked, that cost you something like $345. That is the equivalent of do I use my R&D guy's head or do I use the world? So open up, use the crowd. And let me give you three examples of what crowdsourcing means for me. There are three types. The first one is the wisdom of crowds. Well, what, what does that mean? It means that collectively, we are smarter than just a handful of experts. I'm, I'm putting a caveat in that I'm not saying this is happening in every case all the time. But that is the basis of wisdom of the crowds. And give me, let me give you an example, which is one of my favorites. Very simple and powerful. It's called mystarbucks.com, mystarbucksidea.com. And I have no professional ties with them, but I am a member and I'm an addict. Um, <laughs> this sounds like an AA meeting. The, this web page is simple. It has 150,000 people who are members of them. This is about two or three years old. And people can sh tell Starbucks what their ideas are for a product or a service that Starbucks should implement. And then they filter it and um, do their own decisions, and Starbucks is committed to implementing the best ones in their stores. So you can see, for example, there are 28,566 5, 28, coffee and espresso ideas. And they filter themselves down. I'm one of them, but my idea hasn't been taken up yet, so watch out. But the point here is that Starbucks actually did implement 130 of these ideas, which Initially, you would say, well, that's not that much, Simon, but it's, it's 130 product ideas that Starbucks didn't have. They implemented from the crowd. It's actually proven by the customers. That's what they want. And cleverly, you now have 150,000 people who come to your store, buy the product, because they actually decided that's what they want. That is the wisdom of the crowd. The second one is crowdfunding. And we talked about venture capital before, and I'm happy also to, to later talk about questions about this. By the way, I'm a, I am, as I mentioned, um, from, from Germany, and um, I, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've done one success, one failure, and one draw. So I'm happy to talk about that, too, and about venture capital and how that's working. Um, 
But there's a new game in town, and that's crowdfunding. And one example is Kiva. It's a non-for-profit in the United States, it's about four years old. And what they do, they don't fund startups, but they fund, they give out loans, micro-loans, to small entrepreneurs around the world, like Atilio from Peru, who wants to open up a small agricultural business, and he needs, I think it was $200. And you can, as a person, give $25 to Atilio to fund his company. Kiva, as I mentioned, is only a few years old. They've already given out $352 million. That's a lot for a small little startup. I think they're 10 guys, by the way. 10 guys in a little garage. That's it. And a web page. But the even more amazing part about this is the repayment rate. This is, again, a loan-based business. So I give Atelier money, I wait some time, and then Atelier is supposed to give it back to me. Guess how much that is? The repayment rate is 98.95%. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the future of financing. Venture capital in Europe is dead. That is the future for financing your film, financing your startup, financing your science project. And finally, the third type is crowdsolving. This is what my company does. We take problems from companies or governments, whoever, and we put them on our platform. It's right now we have 260,000 innovators who are, who are waiting for problems to, to solve, and the, the best one, the first one to achieve the stated goals gets a prize. There are people in these 260,000, that's their day job. That's what they do. They don't have a job anymore. They wait on this web page for something that fits their skills and solve this and make money. So we have these serial solvers. That might become a term, who knows? It also comes back to the, the debate a few um, of these uh, gentlemen had and lady about the you know the workforce and mobile workforce. Who knows if that's the future how we work? So I'll tell you about this, my six rules to make the crowd and open innovation a success for you. There are about three hundred fifty thousand rules, but these are the six that I think are the most important. And for each one, I'll give you a quick example to make it more illustrative. Rule number one, the crowd can only eat in single bites. What does it mean is you cannot ask the crowd to create an aircraft carrier for you. You need to simplify it, abstract it, and make it small bites that an individual or a small team can solve it. Let me give you an example. There was a folded a competition called the folded competition. The problem was to create a 3D model of a, of this molecule, which is a, a, a protein um, that transmits HIV. This and it's called the, the Pfizer-Mason uh, disease. The, this problem has been existing for 15 years. The best scientists in the world could not solve it. For, from every institution in the world, it's been unsolvable. What this competition did is they abstracted and made a game out of it. They simplified it a bit, fair enough. Because humans are actually better than computers in perception, in, in anticipation, better than, than you know, giving it to a, a bunch of servers. So they made it a game of folding this protein because a protein's form actually decides its function. This was one, uh, or at least one of the best performers, was a lady from a um, retired teacher from Long Island, New York. And I love her statement when, when she um, got some of the money, she said she has no clue what this is. She just loved the little reds and blue buttons and colors. That's the point. And amazingly, this competition, again, the problem was been unsolved for 15 years. It took 10 days to solve it. Rule number two, do it small, but fully open. It's called open innovation, not slightly ajar innovation. The example here is the Gold Corp Challenge, which very much to our discussion earlier here today about digital economy is about data. So there's this gentleman who bought a gold mine in Canada. This is about five years ago, I would say. But he couldn't find his gold. He knew there must be more gold in his mines, but he couldn't find them. And he had this data set of all these geospatial and seismological data that he accumulated of you know, 
where the gold should be. And he flew in the best experts and he signed NDAs for them. They went down to the vault and you know, looked down all the data and told him where to dig and it was always wrong. And he was about to go bankrupt. He had almost nothing left, no more belief in, in, in it and was about to give up. And with his, last, with his last money and his last belief and his leap of faith, he said, okay, why don't I take that out, the stuff out that is so precious to me, that data, and just give it out to the world. And I say, whoever tells me where my gold is gets $500,000. It went up to 575 because he was so successful, um, but that initially 500000 So he took something that was so important and, and, and valuable to him and, and took, that, took that out and said, hey, crowd, tell me, and I'll pay you if, if you're successful. And it was. This was solved by a team in Australia. They were 3D graphical software um, experts, and they created, out of all this data he gave out, a 3D computer model. And they pointed at a few positions where they thought it was. He tried it. Again, he wouldn't pay until it was true. And as you can see, he found a bit of gold, $6 billion worth of gold. Amazing the value of working with the crowd. Speaking about value and ROI, rule number three, define your ROI from the start, your return on investment. What that means is I see a lot of companies and governments who come to me and say, Simon, this is really important. You're so right. We need to start this crowdsourcing thing. Let's go. And typically, after half a year, if I wouldn't stop, the client, we go back and, and we scratch our head and be like, well, was that successful? What did you actually want to achieve? You just stumbled into this crowdsourcing thing and you know, we didn't measure any success. So whatever you want to do, define your goals measurably from the start. And what I like typically is when there is a, a CFO or a finance director involved because they like to quantify things in money, which makes it easier. So this example is fantastic. Again, all these examples, by the way, I, I didn't do them, which is I'm just telling you examples out there. The Netflix price. Netflix is a company in the United States that rents videos over the internet and buy CDs. One of the added values that they're giving to a customer is that they match and recommend movies. So for example, based on my downloading history, they might say, Simon, there is a new Arnold Schwarzenegger movie coming out. You might be interested. And I might as well. They might also say if the, the data algorithm is not that good, they might say also you might like this new Meg Ryan movie, at which point I'm leaving the site. And that algorithm is what Netflix could quantify. They said if we're improving this matching by 10% of our existing algorithm, that is worth X million to our bottom line of our company. So we can easily give out a $1 million prize because our additional profit, if 10% is achieved, is at least two or three million. Make sense? Which made it very, very easy and successful because you only pay for a return that makes sense to you. And they achieved that. It took them a few years. They had a team of actually gave out milestone prizes, but in the end, a few of the solvers came together, cooperated, beat the improvements, and Netflix paid out that prize. And everybody was happy because they could measure their outgoing, one million, and their incoming, which they didn't say how much, but obviously you would only do it if it's higher than one million. Rule number four, protect yourself by hiding some sensitive parts. Well, if people pay close attention, you might say, well, Simon, rule number two, be fully open. Don't you contradict yourself. To which point, I say, you're right. But you cannot be always fully open. You need to be open in terms of what you do, what you're transparent, uh, be transparent about what it is and be objective. But you cannot just put, let's say, the health data of every German citizen on the internet and run a, a health challenge. You, you couldn't. You couldn't ask Barclays Bank to put every bank details of every customer on there and run a bank-related you know, open innovation project. Fair enough. So I think you have to be open, you have to be transparent, but you also have to protect some sensitive and private data. So what could you do? 
There's a, a great example run by DARPA last year. Yeah, two years ago by now, two, uh, 2010. And DARPA, for the ones who don't know, are a United States government defense agency. What they said is at some point, let's say September 12th last year or two years ago, we put 10 red balloons in 10 different locations in the United States. Who was ever telling us first where they are, the exact geospatial data, wins $40,000. Well, last time I checked, I don't think the Defense Department is really interested in red balloons. So what they've done, and they actually never publicly said why they've done it, but the point here is that you can run an abstract and simplified challenge without giving out the real purpose of it. You can, for example, use public data as well. You could say, let's use this lot of data out there, and I think we talked about open data initiatives, that are related to your problem. Can we use a public data set about genome sequencing, about the weather data, that actually solves you know, your problem to an extent, but you're not using your sensitive data set? So be cognizant of this, that you cannot just use your private sensitive data and put it on the internet. I think that makes sense, but I wanted to, to repeat. Rule number five, and we're almost through to this. Um, rule number five, the world needs to know in order to get a crowd. Believe me or not, this is actually one of the toughest ones because you can do all the first four right. And I've had this before where people sit back and they be like, did everything right? Let's do it. And no one came. It happens all the time. So what do you need to do? This is about make sure you make it attractive. And there are six ways how you get a crowd. And then I'll tell you the example. First of all, the prize money. Well, guess what? If you make it 10 million to do something, you probably get a lot of you know, headlines and, and exposure and people talk about you. But you might not have the 10 million. Secondly, you do some active marketing. You, you make sure that you, you're using you know, the Facebook, the Twitters, and, and you make sure you have a good strategy and people involved that, that make sure you're heard. Thirdly, you create partnerships with universities, um, with um, media outlets, with government entities. Make sure your team and everybody you, you know, doubles the message or triple the message. Number four, you, you make sure you have endorsements. You know, get a Schirmherrschaft, as you would say in German, from celebrities, um, government officials, I always make this example, there's, an, there's uh, an initiative in the United States for veterans affairs, and they had President Obama opening their, their open innovation project. Well, guess what? If President Obama opens something, there's about a thousand journalists following that. So make sure you get people involved to, to do this with you. I'm going to skip the fifth one because I come to this in the example. And you use a good platform. Make sure you use people like us, not necessarily an incentive, but use people like us to go out there and don't recreate everything by yourself, because we already learned a lot of hard lessons. And most, 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 most importantly, have an interesting, creative concept, which leads me to my example. The Triple M Prize, the Mom's Medical Mystery, is something we just launched three weeks ago. The story is something like this. There is a couple. And the, the wife just had her third child a couple of months ago, or actually at this point also a year ago. She was perfectly healthy, but after the birth of her third child, she suddenly developed nightly seizures. Not every night, but almost every second night. Really painful, really long, and she couldn't find out why. They went to every doctor, and believe me, in the United States, it's not cheap, couldn't find a, a cure or a diagnosis. So what he finally did is he came to us and said, look, I have no money but my wife really suffers, can you help us? And we said, okay, we, you know, we're not charging you anything, but we still need to come up with a prize or something. And he said, okay, well, I have $500. So we tried. And it's amazing. The crowd cared. He got, and this is only not even the end of it because it's still ongoing. So if you have ideas, um, log on. We got 1,500 ideas, people who wanted to help and brought in solutions for his problem. We're still evaluating it right now with him. But the power of an outstanding concept that you connect to people, you don't need 500 million, you need only $500 and you get the world engaged. And finally, you need to offer to the crowd more than you're asking for. Again, a very simple logical rule, but many times done wrong. And actually, the example here if you only read the headline, is exactly 
the opposite. Because you cannot say, hey, 10 million for the first person who cures spinal cord injury, which is this example. The reason I put this up, though, is because that is what our client, client came up to us, the Sam Schmidt Paralysis Foundation. And you have to explain to them that this field is, there are billions of dollars in there. There's people researching spinal cord injury every day, and there's money in there already. Your 10 million will not make a difference if, if that's your headline. But what we did develop with them is a set of competitions, milestone prizes, $100,000 for a software-related prize, $200,000 for people from outside the field to come in. So we're creating actually a $50 million prize ecosystem where we bring in outsiders and different fields into this field who to eventually get to it. And the, the top prize hasn't changed, but we're not getting someone from the outside to just solve this for a 10 million price tag. You need to always think, what are you asking the innovator to do? Or, or if it's not even an innovator, what, whoever they are, is the reward higher than what you're asking them to do? And the reward, by the way, doesn't have to be measured in dollars. It can be other values. But it, coming back to you know, whether it's publicity or people like to be recognized, they want to solve a challenge. But you need to make sure that is actually not a balance, but an imbalance in favor of what you're giving them. So I'm, I'm almost done. I can, I'll just leave this one up in terms of what are, what are the inhibitors? What I see is why is this not there yet totally and what is, what is stopping us? Well, the computer with the, the, the lock represents IP rights and privacy. I think they're still we're not there that we're having a, a German techie and a, an American um, startup together with a Chilean medical doctor working on a problem be online because there's a question of who owns the IP, what, what, who has the rights to make a product out of it. There are a lot of people who are working on this in a lot of great platforms, but no one has found that. That, that golden nugget here. The, the, the Chinese symbols in the back symbolize the fact that language is a problem. I think we are we're talking about how do we connect people, how do we get them to work together. There is still a problem, doing, and I can go into detail, but ask me about this later over drinks, um, about languages is a huge subject. Um, this one for the people who, who recognize, and I know my Google friend will, because this is a picture from the DARPA Grand Challenge, which Actually, one of the winners is now pioneered the concept at Google to do this driverless autonomous cars. But the story is not about success, it's about failure, which comes back to also this culture question you, you asked earlier. You also need to be ready to fail. The first DARPA Grand Challenge was an absolute disaster. One of my directors was the director of DARPA at the time, and he, he always loves to tell the story that they spent, so one, one million was the prize, but they spent four million dollars on this competition, which was just a stretch of direct, no curves, direct line of, of, of street in the sand, in, in the desert, in Nevada. They, they couldn't drive, the robots, could, the, the driverless cars couldn't even make that. They actually, it took them, I think, the, the longest one was one mile, and they fell down and crashed. Total disaster. But you need to anticipate that. You need to then have to, what DARPA did. They said, fair enough, we learned something. We're in this for the full game, we do it again. And then later on, they, they succeeded and they actually made great progress that you know leads to a lot of scientific uh, knowledge around the world. So again, part of that means there will be failures. You need to learn from them. You need to think of right at the beginning, what if it fails? What do I do then? And finally, um, this London Business School is not a problem. It's um, <laughs> probably... It, it, it's my reminder of the, the final piece. Part of what I'm here too, which is education. Not education of people, it's education of what is this new field, what is open innovation. Can we, the more data we get, the more studies we have, the more we have data to give to all of you to show you the value of what we're doing. So the reason I have LBS up there is because I mentioned my Harvard study before, so we're doing a study right now with LBS where a professor, um, Gary Dushnitsky, is looking through our data again with a different angle, and he wants to write a paper on it, and we said, fine, fair enough, take whatever you find and run with it, as long as you don't expose any, any you know, details, any names. But the point here is that everything I do, everything that is ongoing, there's no field, we need experiences, case studies, and data, because that's one way of to make everybody more comfortable with this new world. 
And finally, I need to have a company slide up there. Um, you have here my email. Email me, tweet me, link me, Facebook me, whatever you want to do. I'm always, always, always interested of talking about this. I'm happy to debate um, what you could do. I'm, I'm like to help, of course. Part of my job is to make money, but the other part of my job is to to listen and to help and to brainstorm. So email me. You definitely get a response, um, especially if you're embarking on anything cool and fascinating and daring. And I'm exactly at 31 minutes. It's a quarter past eight. So should we break and we do the questions informally then? He is nodding. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.